I'm Joyce Hornady. You might say accuracy is my business. I make bullets. You are listening to the Hornady Podcast. Thanks for joining us and enjoy the show. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Hornady Podcast. I'm your host, Seth Swerzik, and I have a special episode for you today. Special because we have a special guest, none other than the illustrious Jaden Quinlan. Illustrious. Yeah. I don't know if I've had that one. Notorious. <laughs> no. <laughs> Definitely not notorious. I don't know. There's probably some devout followers of maybe some other ballistic gurus in this space that maybe you have some contradicting ideas then, and mm. they might be the opposite of your disciples and then you might be notorious mm, maybe yeah. maybe but uh what we do love is you preach the facts and facts that you have uh come up with through scientific study yeah and that's that's what we appreciate about you well thanks it's been fun doing it it has and on this episode of quinlan's corner we're gonna leave the science in the ballistics lab okay and i want to talk about something way more important okay i don't know about that but we got to talk hunting Okay. I've done that a time or two. Yes. And you enjoyed it a time or two. I did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And it it gets to the point where it's almost, it doesn't take over your life or anything, but. It sure could. It takes over (laughs) your life. I mean, I feel like we go so many months out of the year and the next thing you know, it's like, oh, it's 58 degrees this morning. Yeah. Yeah. Your neck starts to swell up like you're getting into the rut. You know, Uh it's like, oh, it's game time. I got to think about, (laughs) yeah, tags and hunts and rifles and optics and what what am i going to tweak this year i got a new tripod and Mm -hmm. you know all these things that that we enjoy all the gear all of the mental exercise that goes into hunting yeah and hunting for you is something you've done your whole life yeah pretty much yeah from growing up on the the farm in very very rural colorado uh it's kind of a necessity you know i mean it didn't start out with like big game hunting or yeah. say uh licensed animal hunting right where you have to go go get a hunting license um it was mostly prairie dogs and coyotes and jackrabbits back then mm-hmm. but that pretty quickly changes when you're successful at that right at that yeah. um kind of process of of ethically harvesting an animal and then you start to see a big mule deer you know on mm-hmm. your way to on your way to school pop out of a a patch of willows and you know oh, I'd, I'd kind of like to I like kind of like go, to hunt that. Uh-huh. <laughs> and then yeah. you see a big bull elk and then you're just, you're done. Yeah. You're, you're ruined. You, you're ruined. You can't, yeah. ah, you can't come back from that. You really can't. There's no cure, which is good because I don't want the cure. Yeah, absolutely. No. And you know, you, like you said, you started off starting with, you know, non-game animals. We'll call them prairie dogs and coyotes and stuff. Coyotes paid for gas money, be, you know, they being the D. Yeah. Yeah. Which coyotes, you, uh, coyotes helped me graduate high school. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Probably keep you out of trouble. It, well, well, yeah. I might have gotten into some trouble because of coyotes too. Well, that's all right. It's acceptable. It's part of it, you know? Yeah. You got to learn the lateral limits. That's right. Yeah. And unfortunately, there really is no coyote market, which is incredibly unfortunate because yeah. it's it's nice to have incentive to go hunt those because now it's one thing when you just see one out in the pasture when you're, you know, fixing fence or something, you shoot it, but it can get expensive to, you know, you're taking time off of work, you're missing time from your family, you're doing things at night, so you're missing sleep, you got some equipment calls guns etc it's it's not just like oh you see one when you, you see one you're trying to you're trying to go uh, take some coyotes out you know it's it's nice to have be incentivized and it's unfortunate for markets where it's at especially in the coyote and raccoon market not the point of today's podcast though. okay okay so the point of today's podcast is kind of a i'm gonna i'm gonna call it a pilot episode okay where we're I'm just feeling the waters so i'm gonna ask the listener if you like this content, if this was this was enjoyable to you, you got to let us know. Podcast at Hornady.com. Like this video. Subscribe to the channel if you're not already. Uh, and, and reach out to us. Drop the comments here on YouTube. Um, if you're not watching and you're audio only, I'd encourage you to watch this one. But a pilot episode, I want to see if people find this interesting. Okay. And that is, I want to take some notable people on the podcast some of our our guests that people always enjoy their episodes, always have a ton of interaction uh, with our listener base. And I want to dive deep into one of their rifle setups. Okay. Because they're they're unique to the individual. And there's a lot of people that are really curious about what do you use for this? I want to see Miles' gas gun PRS setup. I want to see Joe Teelan's 
you know, tactical PRS setup. I want to see somebody's hunting rifle or whatever. And at first it feels like kind of weird. Cause it's like, oh, I'm just a dude and I hunt with a rifle. Yeah. But I wanted to start this podcast series or potential series with you because obviously your opinion as a senior ballistician trained by one of the best ballistic engineers in recent history, Dave Emery, um, that, that carries weight. Your words carry weight. Your opinions carry weight. And one of the things that I think helps with the weight is that everyone that knows you personally, everybody that listens to the podcast or has gotten to know you through the podcast, it's very transparent that you approach things very factually, very uh, matter of fact, no, very little, if any, emotion, and simply data driven. Yeah. And that's desirable because there's a lot of us uh, in the world where everybody has an ego and it's hard to, to consciously be aware of your ego and keep it in check. So that's one thing that comes through that you do a good job of. And then there's a lot of people in the world that have emotional response to something mm -hmm. and then react when they're under that emotional response. Yeah. And what I've seen over the last 11 years of knowing you is you'll have something happen. You'll experience that emotional response. You'll wait for that emotional response to dissipate, however long that takes. And then you'll look at all of the parameters that are going into this and you'll make a factual assessment and response to that. Yeah. And not to get all philosophical on you, but because of those personality traits, when you build a system, for a hunting rifle or a PRS gun or NRL hunter gun or something like that, mm -hmm. our listener who has picked up on those personality traits of yours can take that for more than just, oh, this is the newest thing. This is the coolest thing. Right. This was the most expensive. I got this for free or whatever. Yep. They can look at your component selection and go, wow, okay, he can articulate exactly why that rifle is put together the way it is. Yeah. And I think that's going to be good for our listener. Yeah, I agree. Um, and I, I, particularly agree with the methodology that you just laid out there as far as I've learned a lot from different experts in their fields over the years that I've had contact with or know by grilling them by saying why is this this way why isn't it this way you know just mm -hmm. getting a, a full depth picture of why something is in my opinion allows you to use it to its fullest potential because through that sort of analysis you can gain the strengths, the weaknesses, the intentions, and and if you do the opposite of that, if you, like you were saying, the emotional side of things, if you just take an emotional response and and act on it, not considering what something is designed for, intended for, or is not designed for, or is weak or, or strong or whatever it, uh, disparity there may be, it it bites you eventually, mm -hmm. and that's can. happened to me many many times. I've I've done I've played that game right. I've chased something that looks cool or boasts my ego or will get attention from somebody that I want attention from. And on almost every single one of those, it, it ends up failing in some manner. Right? right. And so I've, I've taken, you know, we have my hunting rifle on the table here and I've, I've taken that tact with it, uh, in, in many of the aspects about it. So hopefully I can answer your questions. You can, and we're going to just march through this. So for the listener, now's the time we're going to march through every individual component of this rifle system and why you selected it for your ultimate hunting rifle. Okay. And uh, I think before we get into the actual components, let's address what's it's chambered in and why you selected that specific chamber and what it allows you to be capable of and really what this rifle is for. Mm -hmm. So what's the rifle for and what's it chambered in? So the rifle is for hunting and training for hunting. Because those two things are really important. I think all too often we get a rifle meant for hunting, but we don't train with that rifle. And and to me, uh, I don't I don't want anything to be. I don't want to miss out on an opportunity because I squandered the ability to prepare for it. Mm -hmm. So this thing is meant for both of those purposes. Um, it's uh it's currently chambered in, and, and chambers like air quotes here. It's chambered in seven PRC, but. The reason that I say this rifle is for hunting and for training is that uh, the action that I have, the bighorn action, allows me to 
change barrels mm-hmm. without really, I, I can purchase a barrel from many different manufacturers. In this case, that's a, a proof carbon fiber barrel. Um, but I can purchase a barrel from many different manufacturers. I don't have to send it to a gunsmith to get uh, chambered and, mm-hmm. and send them my action to get head yeah, spaced or something. Pre-chambered barrels. Yeah. Pre-fits. And, and that's a big advantage to me personally for that reason in that I, the, the burning a barrel out or using a barrel past its life isn't as big of a concern because I can replace it. That in addition to the fact that I can have a hunting barrel and then I can have a training barrel and I'm shooting the exact same system in both circumstances, the barrel isn't going to cause me to become foreign to the system, right? So right. Uh, typically in the off season, I just put this barrel back on. So this is what I hunted elk with last year, this exact configuration. Um, and I just put that barrel back on because, as you mentioned, the, it's starting to cool off in the mornings. You know, yep. you can tell hunting season's coming. Mm-hmm. Um, but in the summertime, I'll typically throw just a steel barrel on it. Generally, cost is lower. Yeah, it adds a little bit of weight, and that will change the way the rifle feels or the way you shoot it, stuff like that. But not to the not to the point where it's useless. You know, from a training standpoint. Okay. So chambered in seven PRC for your general purpose hunting rifle from antelope to elk Mm -hmm. and you know we'll we'll divulge uh or dive into the story of your elk hunt here towards the end but i wanted to get that out there this is the general purpose oh Jaden, you got to hunt bam you reach for the safe this is what you're grabbing yeah and it's important and i'm glad you mentioned that it's a training system as well as a hunting system yes and that's huge uh that you never want to be the limiting factor in your hunting experience and if lack of training will definitely make you the limiting factor. The 22 Advanced Rifle Cartridge easily outperforms all other 22 caliber cartridges in its class, producing 22 250 performance in an AR-15 platform. The 22 Arc is engineered to take full advantage of the most aerodynamic 22 caliber bullets. This means tighter groups, increased accuracy, and an exceptional shooting experience. 22 Advanced Rifle Cartridge from Hornady. Yeah. So and I also have a, uh, so typically this is either a seven PRC configuration or a 300 PRC configuration. And I'll choose those based on what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. Um, for a long time, I ran it as 300 PRC because seven PRC didn't exist. You know, obviously that's a newer cartridge for us. Um, but I took that cartridge out and put it through my testing um, that establishes whether, whether I'm the limiting factor or whether it's the limiting factor. And the 7 PRC as a cartridge and its performance was not a limiting factor. It was back on me, which is what I want. I don't right. want to be limited by my equipment. I want to be limited by my ability. Okay. Uh, How how'd you fall on that selection? What kind of testing criteria did you did you have? So uh, a couple different things. So I'll take I'll take the rifle and I'll shoot it kneeling, uh, unsupported kneeling. I've had to do that in hunting. You know, taking oh, yeah. a, a really we quick all shot. Have. I'll do that in hunting. Uh, generally, I'll start at about 400, and I'm paying attention to how well I can observe the impact of the bullet on target. So just to steal target at 400, what I immediately noticed with the 7 PRC compared to the 300 was in that amount of an unsupported position, I could, I could more easily see the impact on the target, which is a big deal for me because if you're taking that unsupported kneeling shot, your shot placement is going to have a larger margin of error. That right. if you're laying prone on your belly, you have this long bipod extended or you're shooting off a tripod, right? Yeah. All, all three of those yeah. are and more And you're supported. stretching the legs, a 400-yard unsupported shot while you're kneeling with your elbow on your knee. Right. I don't think you'd probably ever take that shot in the field. That's right. a long shot. So you're testing it at the edge of your performance window. Right. So what I was really doing was testing it against 300 PRC, right? Because 300 PRC had already checked the box. I had hunted with it for many years. So. Uh, so I did the 400 yard test with this and I was surprised, you know, obviously on paper, the seven PRC has less recoil than the 300, but experience. I, yeah. I was, it. I was surprised when I did it, how much difference, uh, it, it, uh, offered me as mm-hmm. far as being able to see that. Then I go out to 800 and I start on my belly prone with a rear bag, super like as stable as you can get. Right. And I do, uh, hit probabilities at 800. Oh, let me back up. All of this is after, you know, shooting stuff at a hundred and making sure the level of dispersion the system has is acceptable, right? You got to pass that first. So then I go to 800. 800 is where I personally draw my line in the sand. And that's based on, uh, 
uh, the, the time of flight to those distances where I'm hunting is, is short enough that the movement of the animal within that time of flight is, is general, unless it's like running, right? I'm not going to take a running 800 yard shot, but, uh, say I have an animal that's grazing or not stressed out and is in a, you know, kind of a static position, um, based on that time of flight, if the animal happened to take a half step or whatever that was, or a full step, it's not going to cause me to gut shoot the animal and make a really bad shot. Now, 800 for me, again, this is for, you have to define your own limit, but that's under super optimum conditions. And I have no option to get closer. That's not something I'm seeking out to go achieve. Um, so the 800 yard test I do is, uh, typically it's like a 10 inch square plate at 800 start prone on my belly and I do a hit probability kind of analysis. Now I can do that on paper, um, take into a bunch of accounts. I think we did that hit probability podcast and talked about all the different inputs Mm -hmm. and you can run those on paper. What's my muzzle velocity variability? What's my group size, all all that kind of stuff and get a good idea, but I want to test it. Right. Um, so I go out and I'll shoot again. Like I've said in the past, this is a a hunting rifle, so I test it the way I'm going to use it. So when I do the hit probability test, I start with a cold, cold gun, cold barrel, just like I'm going to be hunting. I fire a first shot, and then I fire two follow-ups, and then I let the thing cool back off again. And I'll do that repeatedly. So I did that from the prone. I was very happy with the hit probabilities I was getting at that distance. Uh, so then I'll do it sitting off a tripod. Now, am I going to take a sitting tripod shot at 800? No, I'm not going to do it. But what that does allow me to do is assess the hit probability loss that I might experience going from prone rear bag, super stable to off a tripod, which is the next most stable. Right. Um, And then after that, I'll typically uh, extend my bipod legs. So if the, if the listener isn't watching this, I, I, on my hunting rifles, I run the three pull Harris bipod. I think it's like 13 to 27 is the length or something like that. Right. Um, and I'll do some shooting off of that because that's honestly the most likely shot I'm going to take is using the bipod. Sure. Um, so yeah, that if it if it proves itself through there, and then obviously the 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 bullet choice and where I'm going to be hunting and the environmental conditions there mean that that projectile will work out to 800 as designed, and then it passes the kind of shootability hit probability piece I just talked about. Then then it's ready to go. It's ready to go. Awesome. Well, let's dive into it. We got a seven PRC. Uh, we mentioned a couple of the components already, but let's start with the heart of any rifle, and that's the action. Mm-hmm. You know, you've got here a Zermatt uh, Bighorn Arms. They're the, they're the hometown team, mm-hmm. local right here in Nebraska. Why did you select the the Zermatt uh, TL three for this build? A couple different reasons. One, as I mentioned earlier, it it allows me to swap barrels. Sure. And it allows me to source those barrels easily. There's a lot of, you know, it's a, it's a savage barrel, uh, thread spec. So there's a lot, you could even run a barrel nut on it if you wanted to. So if I'm in a pinch, I have a lot of a lot of at my disposal there. Um, you can also swap the bolt faces pretty easily. Okay. So if I wanted to throw back to my youth and put a 30 out six barrel on there, I could do that, right? I could change it from a Magnum into a standard bolt face, um, and don't have to change anything there. Uh, and they're they're reliable. They've been used in competition for a long time. I've used them in competition, which is a great testing bed, in my opinion, for a hunting rifle because you're exposing it to the elements. Dirt. Yeah, dust. Dirt, dust, uh, rain, snow, right? All of that stuff that, hey, I might also be hunting in this. How does this system hold up to that? Competition is a great area to test that because there's not an $800 price tag uh, and a live animal is the consequence of, of having something go down, yep. right? Uh, the bolt field strippable on the TL3. Yep. That's a, 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 a small thing, but something that I feel is very important as well. Yeah. I run, they have a bunch of different bolt knob options. I run essentially the smallest one. I don't know what I they think it's called call a it. diamond. Yeah. I run the smallest one. The reason I do that, and one of the downsides to, to not necessarily the Bighorn, but essentially the Remington 700 pattern action from a hunting standpoint is that when, when the action or when the trigger is in a safe position you can still lift the bolt yep that's a benefit in some ways right because if you had a round chambered you could unload it with it on safe if necessary the downside to it is that the bolt can be lifted with it on safe and if the bolt lifts far enough it'll dump your yeah well it you you can have the bolt partially lift to where it looks kind of closed visually 
but when you go to fire it, oh. some of the energy of the firing pin moving forward is going to cause the bolt to close and you could have a light strike and a failure to fire from it. So some, some rifles out there have features that, that don't allow that, right? The bolts essentially locked it down mm-hmm. until you put it in. You don't have to put it on fire, but you can put it in like a mid-grade position to open the bolt. That is a feature that's handy for hunters, especially if you're walking uh, traditional slung, right? I, I typically don't carry this uh, in a traditional sling manner, but yeah, brush kind of brushes your bolt open. Um, so that would be something that I pay attention to knowing that that's a limitation of it. Awesome. Well, side bolt release, field strippable bolt, swappable bolt heads, guaranteed head space, the hometown team, obviously easy decision to go with a Zermatt uh, sure. or previously Bighorn Arms. Jumping into the barrel, you know, kind of the other part of that action. You mentioned it earlier, you got a proof research, Sendero. Uh, how long is the barrel and what's the specs on that? A uh, 22-inch barrel, uh, factory chambered by proof mm-hmm. for 7 PRC to be a prefit for the TL3 action. One and eight twist, standard Sammy, everything. Mm-hmm. Excellent choice. And that's one of the things that is becoming increasingly more popular is people going shorter, a little bit, little bit shorter barrels. Mm-hmm. I've had bigger manufacturers reach out to me and say, hey, we're going to chamber 7 PRC. You know, can, can we, are you okay if we do a 20 or a 22 inch barrel Mm -hmm. and it's thumbs up ergonomics, which pairs right into what's on the end of that barrel. Yeah. A little, uh, little five inch ultra, uh, from Thunder Beast. Um, I really love the Thunder Beast suppressors. I've used them, um, for many, many years. I I have a 30 P1, which like the OG. Yeah. Yeah. They, they hadn't even entered the ultra series by then. Um, those guys were nice enough to to redo it for me so it's now got the ultra the cb brake attachment to it so i can still use it now oh, that all yeah. my guns have a cb brake on them um, but i really love that suppressor it's a it's a it's a great balance point between length like you said because in this same configuration years ago i hunted it with a 26 inch 300 prc barrel with a seven inch can on it and that sucker was long. Excalibur. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I had, my thighs were getting sore from crouching down low enough to get under pinion trees. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so you like the Ultra 5 because it's still relatively quiet, even with a Magnum, but the trade-off in a little bit of decibels is, it's compact. Size and weight. Yeah. yeah. It's very light. It's, it's compact. It's a great suppressor. Awesome. Yeah. And went with the carbon fiber barrel. Um, talk us through that. I know. Obviously, there's a bunch of carbon fiber barrel manufacturers out there now more than ever, but Proof Research, Carbon 6, there's a, you know quite a few of them out there, mm-hmm. and it gives you a weight reduction for length and diameter, and you're running a suppressor, it's nice to have some shoulder. That's there. right. Yep. Yeah, the carbon fiber barrel, uh, generally, they're a lot more expensive than a steel barrel, but with this system, I'm okay with that at at additional cost because that barrel is essentially used for hunting only. So it's going to last me a really long time. For training, again, like I said, I typically throw a steel barrel on it just because the cost of burning that barrel out in training isn't as hard on the pocketbooks. The HIT Target Impact Indicator. Instant HIT confirmation at extended ranges has never been easier. The HIT Target Impact Indicator easily attaches to most target stands and not the steel target itself. The highly sensitive internal accelerometer detects vibration when the target is impacted, activating the red LED lights that flash Morse code for HIT. Where impact confirmation can be difficult, light it up with the HIT Target Impact Indicator from Hornady. Exactly. All right. So you've got a tricked out barreled action. Uh, looking at the trigger now, you can't have a barreled action without a trigger in there. A lot of good triggers on the market. You know, we've seen some new ones come out. You know, Timney kind of had a, a refacing. They've launched some new triggers in the last few years. Uh, trigger Tech, obviously a, a, a mainstay in the trigger game. Rise has came out with some 700 triggers. What are you running for hunting on this rifle? I'm running a Trigger Tech. Okay. Uh, and the reason for that, again, is back to that competition proving ground. Um, you see a lot of different triggers used in competition. See and, a lot of failures. And you do see a lot of failures. And I've had them myself uh, with certain triggers. I've been running the Trigger Tech trigger for, I don't know, somewhere between five and eight years. I don't know when I got my first one. And I've had no issues with it. And I've had them in some nasty environments. They've sure. been dusty. They've been completely soaked with rain. They've been frozen, very, you know, <laughs> sub-zero frozen. And I haven't had any issues with them. And to me, although although it is a competition trigger, 
in general, right? The reputation of a trigger tech is, is being used in competition. I'm not a huge light trigger pull need kind of guy. Um, my opinion is if your fundamentals are correct, you should have the exact same shot placement. It just might take you a little bit longer yep. if your trigger pull is heavier or longer or whatever it may be. So that thing's not adjusted down. To, it's it's probably up towards the maximum um, on, on its adjustability. Three pounds, three and a half pounds. Yeah. Yeah, which for hunting, uh, I've run a lot of uh, trigger tech field triggers mm -hmm. and those don't go below two pounds. And yeah. I think their max is four and I run them about two and a half pounds. Yeah. I feel like that's a good balance for me if, when it's cold, your fingers are cold. You don't want something super light. Right. Um, so just a classic curved shoe running, like you said, three, three and a half pounds. Mm -hmm. yep. Just, just right. Yep. So barreled action tricked out. We'll talk about some other things, uh, but let's get with, when you look at the rifle, you see the stock. Mm -hmm. Walk us through the selection of this specific stock because there's a bunch of good ones out there and we have relationships all over the industry. Yep. And man, you want to talk about a good time to be alive as a hunter. Manners has some outstanding lightweight hunting yes. options. The IOTA stocks, I mean, McMillan, you name it. But this one, a Graybo Phoenix. Yeah. Um, that one met a lot of things I was looking for at a, at a more economical uh, price point, maybe, right? There's stuff out there that's way more expensive that has similar features. Um, Graybo seems to have hit a place in the market where they're, they're really providing that in a good way. Um, I went with the Phoenix... I, I really like adjustable uh, cheek heights. Yeah. Uh, I think my cheek height of my face structure, probably since I live in a cave, uh, oh, is yeah. odd. More right? Neanderthalish. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I get on a lot of rifles that other people have adjusted for them, and I'm like, oh, I don't know. I need to change this. Uh -huh. um, so I'm, I'm a big fan of that. Um, the, the, the weight is good. You can see it's kind of not skeletonized, but it, it doesn't have excessive yeah. material. Relieved. Yeah. 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 Um, the, the M lock rail systems up front. I really like that. Um, I'm still running a, a Picatinny for my bipod attachment up okay. front. I do have the Arca plate back behind it, as you see there, but from a traditional rifle stock where you just have a sling swivel up front, or maybe even two sling swivels up front, um, going to a tripod, which I'm sure we we'll will talk, talk about. about, uh, specifically for that elk hunt has been very important. And, and not necessarily a saddle, but clamping into the tripod right. has, has been a, a big improvement in capability. Um, and then has the, the you know, uh, magazine cut allowing you a lot of different different options there for what you want to run for yeah. a magazine. Comes installed with some cutie flush cups. Yes, which, is, which was another factor for me. So like I said earlier, I don't carry this in a traditional sling format like you'd have with your sling studs uh, on a traditional stock. Um, this I, I run the QD cups and and frankly I carry it a lot like uh like you would an AR um, I run muzzle down or up either okay. way uh, depending on conditions diagonal across your chest yeah and and uh, I use one of my adjustable slings that I've had for many many years um, for that and the reason that I carry the rifle that way is because I've carried a rifle that way a lot yeah uh, I'm familiar with it being there. It seems to be out of my way. I can go hands off. Uh, so with an adjustable style sling, like an over tighten, right on a two point tactical sling, being able to hit the hit the over tighten strap, get that thing sucked down to my body. If I do, if I need both hands available, yeah, climbing, climbing up a super steep face or grabbing hold of a tree branch or whatever it may be. Um, and then typically, what I do if it's in that super tight configuration, but I need to get the rifle out right away. I use the front QD for that. I just bust the front QD off and the rifle's right there in my hands ready to go. Simple. So that works really well yeah. for me. And you mentioned, you know, carrying it in that manner because you've car carried guns in that manner for a long, long time. Uh, lends itself to, uh, that that idea lends itself to why you might have chosen this stock. I don't know this, but you've been a competitor for a long time. You've been a long range marksman for a really long time. And this a little bit more vertical grip. Mm -hmm. It feels probably like a lot of your competition and other long range rifles feel. Yep. So it's yep. just that, that ergonomic that you don't have to, oh, this is foreign. Mm -hmm. It just feels like it should. And grip angle plays a, a lot into that. Yeah. And the flat bottom that they have of that, although it's not real wide, it is flat on the bottom and, and the competitive shooters out there will know the advantage to that on being able to throw a rifle up on any random objects and get it to, to stabilize. Balance. Yeah. Awesome. Well, it's a great stock and a great little color scheme. It obviously looks good. 
Moving now to bottom metal, mm-hmm. um, like you'd mentioned, you can get this cut for a lot of different things. Walk us through why you chose that bottom metal. So that's the Hawkins Hunter bottom metal, okay. um, and I'm a huge fan of it. Early in this, I've had this rifle set up in in kind of this configuration for I don't know eight nine years probably, and before that, I was running a traditional M5 style bottom metal with a single stack. Um, CIP length AICS magazine because I was running 300 yeah. PRC then yeah. and uh, it's got a longer cartridge overall length and frankly it had the you know the tabbed uh, magazine release at the front of the trigger guard mm-hmm. and I fought that thing pretty bad especially <laughs> <laughs> especially the way I carry the rifle up front slung across my chest like that I also run a, a hill people gear kit bag up front for my binos and hunting license and just extra stuff and what I found was if that rifle was slung muzzle up, the weight of it's sagging down, and that happens to take the little ears of your magazine release on those style, you know, uh, mag releases, and I kept bumping it up in the magazine loose. So um, when the guys over at Hawkins, which is a, a great group of folks, they make some really cool products, when, when they came out with the Hunter Bottom Metal, that was a no-brainer. Uh, awesome. It's fed really well. It's a three-round magazine. Um, I've got two, so right? So one's in the rifle, and then I keep one in the little kit bag up front yeah, and, and flush really yeah 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 if you needed to rest on the magazine to fire a shot back to you know throwing it up on some random object it's definitely doable excellent moving forward from that you've got an arca rail mm-hmm. this is a, a shadow tech arca rail little inch and a half long we'll talk more about tripods in a moment but you got an arca rail on there and then you mentioned the picatinny and your bipod mm-hmm. uh you selected long dong silvers yes one. mm-hmm yeah, uh, it looks way cooler with a shorter bipod where you can get, you know, super prone and tactical. Yeah, and, and, look, and then a sagebrush you says uh, you're not going prone. That's right, yeah. Yeah, you look cool, but you can't see anything. Um, yeah, I run the longer bipod uh, for that reason. So I can still shoot prone with it. It's kind of a high prone, yeah. w- which is not as stable as a low prone with a bag, but um, it's certainly more stable than offhand with a sling, mm-hmm. right? Um, but more so the ability to quickly deploy both of those bipod legs and be able to take a, a fairly stable sitting or kneeling or whatever that kind of mid position shot is, has been really beneficial. I run the Picatinny attachment because I do carry the short Harris in my backpack, um, typically on an outer pouch where I can access it pretty easily. Mm -hmm. And I have the QD attachment, um, you know, sling swivel ADM, to, yeah, yep, and, and because I can pop that off super quickly and I can put on the short one if I needed to, it, it only takes a couple seconds. Right. So I do, I kind of build that factor in, but what is on the gun all the time is that. Universal. And then now jumping up top to the money maker here, if you will, you got an optic on here. And again, we've got friends all over the industry that make world-class optics and there are so many good options that could top this thing. Uh, what do you got on top of this one? So that's a Night Force NX8, uh, the 4-32. to 32. And prior to that scope, I was running the Leupold Mark V, the 5-25. to 25. Loved that thing. It yeah. was, was awesome. Still do. Still do. The reason that I tried this one out, and I've only done one hunt with this scope. The reason I tried that one out was because of the magnification range, that 4-32. to 32. I'm never going to take a shot at 32. Probably never going to take a shot at 20. I mean, most of my shots... Um, outside of say three or 400 yards are going to be taken somewhere between like 12 and 16, maybe 18 power. Mm -hmm. So what's the purpose of having an optic that goes above and beyond that from a magnification window? Well, uh, you know, a lot of us West, if if you're Western hunting, spotting scopes are used pretty commonly to, to get an idea of, is that animal worth pursuing? That's, you know, two or three thousand yards away. And and my thought there was the glass quality is really good in the Night Force. Um, if I could crank that thing up to 32, I'm approaching spotting scope levels of magnification for identification of, of animals or whatever I'm trying to look at far away, right? Right. And it served pretty well for that. I did use that a little bit on that last hunt, um, and it went well. The low-end magnification uh, at four power gives the ability to take a pretty quick up-close shot. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, you might be... Uh, it might be a benefit of going a little bit lower than that, but I think four is fine. It's a I mean, good trade off. Yeah. Yep. Um, so it worked really well. The Night Force tracks really well. The glass is good. Um, yeah, I was, I was pretty happy. And with it's that. mill, mill, first focal plane. Mill, mill, first focal plane. I, if, if anybody catches me doing anything different than that, I'll give you some money. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and, and that goes back to carrying the slung the way you do. 
uh, choosing a rifle stock with a vertical risk, choosing mill mill and first focal plane. When you've done something now for almost half your life, it's it you, you want to stick with something because in the heat of I got to get a bullet in this animal and the adrenaline and whatever. Yeah. You never want to go back to your default, which is first focal plane, mill, mill. Right. And then grab a minute of angle turret. Exactly. Uh, yeah. That would, that would send me for a loop. Yeah. And mounted in some rings. What are they? So those are uh, area 419 rings. Okay. Uh, I typically use the, the same as the Hawkins bottom metal. I typically use Hawkins rings. Um, what I found with this one was, uh, in with that loophole I had on there, I had so I like the Hawkins rings for two reasons. Uh, one is the bubble level on the rear on the rear ring. So this gray bow has a little bubble level here just behind the tang of the action. I find that's useful, but I find that where my eyes are oriented when I'm looking through the scope, I can look up at the with my left eye. I can look up at the bubble level that's at the top of the Hawkins ring and still see through the scope. If I look down at the bubble level that's in the stock. I lose my ability to see through the scope. It's more right. of a angular change to the eye for me. Um, the reason I don't have the Hawkins on this one was because I didn't have that ring size available. Oh. Um, but the area 419 rings are awesome. They're they're They have a ton of grip. They're, they're nice and low profile. I really like that feature. Um, yeah, they've been, they've been great rings as well. SnapSafe modular assembly system locks the thick steel exterior together in minutes anywhere in the home. Featuring a pry resistant 3 16 inch solid steel door, 8 1 inch chrome steel live locking bolts, digital or mechanical locking options, 9 gauge steel exterior walls, 2300 degree Fahrenheit 1 hour fire shield protection, fully adjustable shelving, and a lifetime warranty. SnapSafe, a modular safe with welded safe security. Awesome. Well, it's an outstanding rifle setup for a, a variety of things. Anything on this continent, uh, take anywhere, do anything with. It's accurate. You are the limiting factor, not this rifle system. And then one last thing uh, that I mentioned that's physically on the rifle, you have a, I'm guessing, a secondary or tertiary hard dope card attached to the rifle. Yes. And so, you know, the viewers can see I run a piece of shock cord with a tension buckle and then I just tie a, a knot on the end. Um, I do that because I can move it right to either side of the rifle. So if I had to take a left-handed shot, I can, I can still use that card. Typically what I do when I'm walking around, because you don't want this thing flopping is I tuck it down into the barrel channel like yeah. that stays put away. Um, but yeah, this is a, a card that I, I you know it's no name brand or anything. It's no. something that it's I made. It's Excel. It's Excel. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, which if anybody that knows you, you're a freak in the Excel sheet. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, but it's, it's a pretty basic sheet. So the drop card has, uh, starts at a hundred yards and goes, uh, 160, 180, then 200 kind of just big chunks there mm -hmm. because your trajectory is fairly flat in that distance. Um, and then from 200 on out to 1200, cause sometimes I shoot coyotes when I'm elk hunting. I've um, been known to toss a shot out at a coyote. Yeah. I've got that broken up into every 20. Um, and then the way I make my cards, I kind of have some special ways where I make it visually fast to get to where um, you're headed to get to yep. the solution. Uh, it's got elevation corrections, windage, um, for a uh, five mile an hour wind at 90 degrees and then five mile an hour at 45. And the reason I run both of those is the math's really easy. So, uh, wind deflection is a function of the wind speed. So if it's a 10, I double it for me, doubling numbers is faster for me than having numbers. Yeah. So a lot of guys like to run a 10 mile an hour to get to a five, you got to half it. I like to double it, especially as you get into those in-betweener speeds. So let's say I got a seven. Uh, I see my five cause it's written down. I'll double it in my head to my 10 and then split the difference right. really quickly. Um, that I run the 45 as well, just so I have that reference and I'll kind of just make a judgment call because rarely is the wind ever at 90 or at 45. It's always yeah. somewhere between. And that's like I said, secondary or tertiary, whether you, you run a Ford off on your phone, a Ford off Kestrel, or you got something in some binos. Yeah. Um, it's nice to have hard data. Yep. And then I also have a little table off to the right for, uh, angle fire stuff. So typically oh. what I'll do there is I'll, I'll set a 10 degree angle and then I'll go start looking at what point does my drop value change by two tenths of a mil from from the flat fire trajectory? And that becomes the first one I notate. And okay. then I'll do 10 and 15 and 20 typically for the angles. 
Um, so that's just small tables over there on the right. Um, I have the aerodynamic jump value is just a, a fixed correction factor down at the bottom. Uh, in this case, it's 0.08 mils, so about a tenth. Uh, and then I do I do record the mile an hour of the gun. I don't know. There's some users out there that will be familiar with that. So yep. the, the mile an hour of the gun is essentially at 500 yards or meters, whatever units you're working in, uh, what amount of wind speed equals a half mil of wind deflection. So 500 for 0.5. Mm-hmm. That becomes the mile an hour of the gun. So in this case, it's an, where I was hunting, it's a 9.3 mile an hour gun. Which is good. Yeah. yeah so that's really good. The benefit to that is at 400, it's 0. 0.4. At 300, it's 0. 0.3. 200, yeah. it's 0. 0.2. Um, so you can really rapidly make a call with based on one number. That's that's a nice way to do it. Yep. Awesome. Well, Jaden, this is an outstanding setup. And there's one more piece of, of gear I want to just briefly mention before we wrap this thing up. And that is, you talked about it, the tripod and how important that is like for your last elk hunt, and that's why you run an ARCA rail on your rifle. That's right. Yeah, the the last elk hunt I had, um, the only elk I got behind the rifle on the whole hunt, I could not have seen him or harvested him the way I did without that tripod. I was on the downslope of a hill. My bipod legs did not extend high enough for me to be able to deploy them and still see him. I guess I could have taken an off head and standing shot, but in all honesty, he was big enough. I don't know if I would have hit him like big enough in size that my knees were shaking bad yeah. enough. <laughs> I don't think I could have made that shot. Uh, I'm sure I, I'm sure I could. You could have talked it down, down but. but he was a giant elk and like the old adage goes, why stand if I can kneel? Why kneel if I can sit and why sit if I can go prone? Well, why offhand if I can clamp into a tripod and the tripod for glassing with binos, glassing with a spotter and then clamping into is almost become as important of a piece of kit as a pair of binoculars. Like I know there's a lot of us in here don't hunt without one. That's right. Awesome. So for the listener, sage advice, if you're out there and you've hunting in the, the frontier West or the mountain West or, you know, anywhere where there's big open country, consider a tripod. Absolutely. And also consider building a rifle like this one. Yeah. I really like this because compared to, to purchasing a rifle, which there's nothing wrong with that. No, but of course. Your ability to customize and pick every little piece of the build for a specific reason, you, you have that when you build your own. It's definitely more expensive in a lot of cases to do it this way. But to be honest with you, I have this rifle for hunting, one, two, two different factory rifles for hunting. One of them is the one I grew up with, my mm-hmm. old 30-06. I'm of never going to get rid of that. Um, the other one is a Browning 6.5 Creedmoor, um, just factory rifle. But I don't have 50 factory hunting rifles no I, what i did is instead of doing that having a different tool for every single job is i put the money into one tool that i can adapt into every job i want and then i can try to select the highest quality components available awesome well Jaden, i mentioned it in the podcast several times we've got friends all over the industry this is not singling any one of them out this is yeah. just your build and you did a great job and i think our listeners going to see your factual and methodical approach to each component selection. So unless you have anything else, I appreciate you coming on and diving into this hunting rifle. And I know you got some hunts coming up this fall. You got deer in Wyoming in October. I do. Might see this one out there with it. Uh, (laughs) Awesome. Well, I wish you the best of luck. Thank you. Guys, thanks for tuning in to this episode of Quinlan's Corner. I hope you enjoyed getting a behind the scenes look at the component selection for Jaden's ultimate hunting rifle. We hope you enjoyed it. Catch you on the next one.